Three years ago, we met in this very same room to host and to all, we organized the first Global Lean Healthcare Summit, which brought the pioneers in the healthcare world that had somehow found lean as an answer to their own crises and had made some initial progress with lean. We brought those people together in this room for the first global event, and that was an electrifying event. A lot of people vying to tell even more impressive stories about their problems often and about their initial steps to solve those problems. And those people met each other and healthcare, lean in healthcare, has taken a huge leap forward uh, as a result of those connections and the inspiration that everybody got to go off and transform the health industry as we have been with every other industry using lean. So I'm hoping that this event will also be a bit of a landmark in the lean movement and will also trigger the engagement of top management with lean, which I think is the number one challenge as we go ahead. So that's the, the reason for us being here. I regularly, I only organize summits when we have a lot of new material to share. And I've been going around the world collecting questions, listening to stories. And indeed, I've chosen a provocative title. In the lean world, when you see results driven lean, particularly if you come from the United States, you think of Jack Welsh and GE and results, I don't, know how much, don't care how you get them as being the objective. That's not my point. My point is here that we've done a lot with lean to engage people, to create awareness, to create pilots, to learn how to use lean. But now times are tougher and we actually have to be much more focused in our application of lean and we really have to do things that really do connect to results. So it's as much obviously about the means as the results, but we can't lose sight of the results. And we have to be a lot more focused in generating the kind of results at an organization level that lift that organization from the pack. Just as many years ago when we started working with Tesco, Tesco was an also ran retailer in the UK and partly through lean, certainly a large part of their success, uh, they actually just completely changed track and became now the third largest retailer in the world. I'm looking for those organizational level demonstrated performance that stands out from the pack that actually triggers the need for everybody else to do lean as well. So that's the point of my provocative title. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight, the contribution of Toyota to management practice, which I think has been profound and will continue, I think, to reverberate for many decades to come. I think looking back, this is really with a result of quite a unique synthesis that Toyota brought together three different improvement streams and integrated them into its own synthesis, into its own unique business system that we've been studying and layer by layer unpeeling the onion to understand in more depth. And those, three thing, those three strands historically start with the focus on organizing the flow of work, the horizontal activities that actually create the value customers pay for, that really they were inspired by Henry Ford, the early Henry Ford, and with the Model T factory in which the entire fabrication, casting, fabrication, assembly process was one totally integrated flow of work. That Henry Ford couldn't sustain, that Alfred Sloan then took us off on a completely different track by organizing by activities and keeping activities busy. And the work somehow then moved from queue to queue through those different products, st production steps. Process thinking says that in addition to organizing vertically, we also need to add another dimension, which is to refocus also on organizing the horizontal flow of work. That was a fundamental contribution. And Taiichi Ono's own experiments starting in the 30s with loom manufacture and going through the 50s and 60s 
uh, really, through trial and error, demonstrated how it was possible to also focus on the flow of work with a complex range of products. A tremendous breakthrough that was our initial inspiration and interest in Lean. So a combination of very early inspiration that you can trace back to the Arsenale in Venice and probably further back in history, organizing along the flow of work. The second, which was also really interesting, was that Toyota learnt, and John Shook discovered, as he was tasked when he first got to Toyota with translating the material, the training material, uh, into American to prepare for the Numi plant, he discovered that, in fact, Taiji Ono had actually drawn on the learning by doing program that was designed by the US government called Training Within Industry to teach largely women who are coming to replace men who went off to fight in the Second World War. And that huge acceleration of industrial production that happened during World War II was largely a result of a very, very quick learning by doing training program that was enormously effective and formed the basis of the way in which Toyota also teaches people through learning by doing. So that learning, learning by doing dimension really came from that example. And the third, of course, is the quality approach. Yes, the understanding of the root causes of variance, but actually it's much broader than that. It's actually the use of the scientific method or the scientific approach to treating the analysis of processes, the treating the analysis of work steps, to prioritizing activities, to the PDCA process, the whole plan, do, check, act discipline. Toyota added that in the 60s after Nissan won the Deming Prize and used that as a very powerful integrative tool to integrate the progress that was being made in production and production engineering right across all of the other functions of the organization. So the synthesis of those three improvement streams that are still independent, exist independently, but I think are increasingly we're seeing that they need to be seen as a, an integrated whole that led, of course, to the many tools and techniques that we're all familiar with in this audience. And it led us to deconstruct that and to go one step back and say, well, what are the fundamental principles for designing these horizontal flows of work? And that led Jim and I to define the five principles of, uh, of, of Lean that were essentially principles for designing that horizontal flow of work as a way of integrating the tools which were applied to remove the bottlenecks to those flows. But we've also, in the last few years, been realizing that actually behind this, of course, leads, lives a different way of managing and leading. And I think we've made a lot of progress over the last few years in describing Toyota's management system, in describing the different tools, the management tools, the A3, policy deployment, standard work, standard management, all of those things we've elaborated and described. But I'm still of the opinion that actually it isn't the tools themselves, although they're very important, it's how those tools are used. It's the glue, it's the logic, it's the, the way in which people think about using these tools that actually is what integrates this system. And although we have great descriptions of the Toyota management system, we don't yet have a completely deconstructed, rebuilt set of principles on which we can build a functional equivalent. Because we know that copying alone, without copying the thought process behind it, doesn't work. So the further you get away from the automotive example, the more important I think it is for us to find and understand the management principles, the principles behind this management system, for us to be able to build our own functional equivalent of that management system and of the logic and principles for how it is used. So let's start with the work of management. What is the work of management? I think it can be summarized in five headings. And I think you can see this at any level of management. It's a fractal concept. First, to decide what's important what's important for the organization, 
what's important for the current management, what's important for customers, what's maybe important for employees. So what is important is actually deciding what has to be done right now, what can wait. The second principle is then to launch improvement activities, initiatives, projects, cost-cutting programs, whatever they are, to, imp to launch improvement initiatives to change things to address those important concerns. And the third is what probably takes most of management's time, is actually dealing with problems. Problems happen all the time. Chaos seems to be the norm in many organizations, and firefighting is the consequence. And what we'd like, of course, is for a common way of addressing those problems to create greater stability. So we don't have to spend so much time in firefighting, we can spend more time in improvement. And fourth, we need always to be concerned about educating the next generation of management, because it's a dynamic process, of course. And the fifth, which I would add, which I think is increasingly going to be important, particularly as we get into this web era, is actually to rethink our organizations and rethink what we do in the light of future challenges. Now, that is typically how I hear statements about vision statements of organizations or principles phrased. And yet, actually, there's not much you can do with that. So I think we need to turn those into actionable questions. And these are my five questions to address those five tasks of management. And I think we should have a debate about this. These are hypotheses as to useful questions that will lead us to the right kind of thinking. First is, how can we focus everyone on the vital few? That is a much more difficult thing to do than I think we realize. Actually understanding what the vital few are and then being able just to address those and focus all of our efforts on those things is one of the hardest things to do. Deselection, in my experience, I can dream up a thousand things I'd like to do. Actually deselecting and saying I'm not going to do all of those, I'm going to focus on just the vital few is really, really hard to do. And yet, if we're going to be effective, that is going to be a very, very key part in improving our effectiveness as managers. The second is turning these wishes for improvements into performance gaps. What are the performance gaps we want to close in order to make those improvements? So now we can actually talk about something we can measure. We can track, we can see the size of the gap, the cause of the gap, etc. And we can also see progress towards closing that gap. So we need to turn those into performance gaps that we can measure and close. And this one is problematic. You could phrase this in many ways. I think it is partly about creating the right behaviors. I think it's also about creating the right conditions in which people willingly want to work together more effectively. I think that would be another way of phrasing that. So it's actually creating the conditions into which people are willing to work to eliminate the chaos and unnecessary variation in their work and in their interaction with others, so we actually create a much greater stability in processes. So I've called it creating the right behaviors, and we can debate that. The, third, the fourth one is creating the next generation of managers. Well, this is all about learning. This is all about the capabilities we need to develop in the next generation to be able to sustain and, and build on these gains. And the fifth one, then, is actually about learning to do new things, which for a big organization that's been successful, that has very well established practices in place, is also not an easy thing to do. And yet, there are times when organizations can be rapidly overtaken by events as the world changes. And I think we're at one of those times. So there are two sides to all of these five questions. And in the rest of my talk, I want to talk about the two sides to these different questions. Now, when we started working with Tesco many years ago, I learned one thing is we can't do everything. 
We had 30,000, 40,000 products in the supermarket. Impossible to value stream map and improve 40,000 products. But actually, only 1,000 products account for most of the movements. So actually, we could have a big effect if we just focused on the vital few. And then the second thing we did was, was the most powerful thing we did was take a walk with a bunch of executives, senior executives, right through the supply chain, the Tesco supply chain. And they'd all been there, they'd run stores, they had a good operational understanding. They immediately saw all the waste in their supply chains and it triggered a lot of improvement activities thereafter. I have seen that that is extraordinarily difficult for other industries to do, notably healthcare. Fundamentally, we need to start, of course, by asking what is who are our customers and what is, what is the real demand on our system, whether it's a supply chain, whether it's a hospital system, whether it's a financial service response process, whatever it is. What is the demand? Who are the customers? Who are the most important customers? Not all of the customers. Who are the ones that account for the bulk of our sales? Which of the products account for the bulk of our sales? Probably actually a very small fraction of products. So let's work on those. Let's not worry about the tail to start with. Let's create flow in the bulk of our work. What is the real demand and how much is demand that's simply created by a chaotic, broken system that we need to get rid of initially in order to then design a system to cope with real demand? So there are various questions we need to ask to dig down to understand what is the demand we really want to work on. And then the second is learning to see the organization as a collection of processes. And I never, ever got anybody in the healthcare industry to draw this for me. So I drew this, and then they went, oh, yes. Because they wanted to talk about the particular pathway for a particular condition, whereas I wanted to talk about the flow of patients going through the process. And there are three flows. There's a diagnostic flow, you come to get something checked out. And you often don't stay, you have a diagnostic process and you go back. And then there's a second process when you need something to be done about that, which is the, this maybe a surgical problem, that you may even be, need to be admitted to the hospital for. So that's the second flow. And the third flow is the unplanned but highly predictable flow of emergency patients, medical patients usually, through the hospital, which is the largest flow. Actually, the difference between the planned and the unplanned flow is not great. And in most industries, we have some unplanned and some planned demand anyhow. Most of it is predictable in its pattern. So, okay, so now we can uh, see what the major flows are and they're much simpler than most people think. Now the question is, well, where are those flows broken? So where should we act in order to improve those flows? And you could track quality. Where are the defects? Where are the errors? You could track delays and queues, as I've roughly done here. You can track the cost. Where are the cost, most costly wastes in this process? And you're immediately led, of course, to the delay for elective patients, for people coming in for diagnostic tests, long waits, and think that's the problem. Until you start walking through the hospital and noticing, actually, it's not the front end of the hospital, that's actually a symptom of a blockage at the back end of the hospital. Typically, 25-30% of patients are ready to go but can't because a whole load of things haven't happened that is actually blocking the flow at the front end. So as we walk a process, we begin to see where it is actually fundamentally broken and where it isn't. Now, we do this all the time as lean thinkers. We think holistically about the process but we also think reductionist in terms of what is the flow of that patient going through the process, and we have to do both. And this is what I would call go see the facts. Data will never tell you these stories, will never show you what is really going on. You have to go and take a walk. So on the one hand, we're trying to see 
the processes, the demand, and the problems, then the next stage is how do we use the scientific method to dig down those causes? What are actually not problems, they're symptoms of a deeper cause that we can't clearly see? But if we could, then we could address those deeper causes and have an impact on many other aspects. In this case, very interesting, we started out, as many people did, thinking it was a problem at the front end of getting a diagnostic treatment, and discovered that was a symptom of a back-end blockage of the medical flow, which is the dominant flow, and so therefore we would need to design the end-to-end the -end patient journey through the hospital. But in fact, that turns out also not to be the problem. That's a symptom, the fact that that doesn't happen is a symptom of a deeper problem, which is a complete disengagement in the English system, at least, of manage from, management from the front line. We've pu published a paper called the, the Bermuda Triangle of Management in the NHS, which is one of the papers on, uh, on the website that I'd, I'd urge you to look at, which talks about the disengagement of management as it focuses on directives coming from the government, from headquarters, and is completely obsessed and preoccupied and has no time to spend dealing with the operational realities on the front line. So you can read that paper. I'm not going to go through the analysis. But the point I'm making here is we always need to keep digging back through what we think are problems to actually the symptoms of a deeper problem. And it's only by digging down to those deeper problems that we will be effective in solving all of these symptoms. So that's a discipline that I think most of us still need to learn. And it's probably one of the most powerful disciplines, which I will come back to later on in the talk. And the language that frames that thought process is this A3, which is a Toyota's version of the Plan Do Check Act process that we will also have workshop. Dave, Dave will do a talk on, on that and run a workshop on that later. And the power of A3 thinking for the, at this point is that it focuses us on having to go through the analysis step by step and to go through and complete the analysis, the check and act stages. We're pretty bad at planning because we always jump to solutions. And management, traditionally, as they cannot see the problem, launch 100 projects, which eats up management time and takes management away from the shop floor. But this frames the language of having to go through a disciplined process of really arguing and understanding the problem, the facts, the objectives, the root causes, the countermeasures, and so on. And that language frames the discussion about what we don't do, the deselection process. It gives us much greater confidence to deselect. And also frames the dialogue as we deploy improvement projects across the organization. And it helps us turn the problems into performance gaps. So those are the two sides of the vital few. We are very familiar with thinking about a value stream and following a product or more typically a product or a patient or a design or a, uh, an activity through a process, usually a shared process. And our objective is to use the lean tools to uh, remove the obstacles to the flow of work and to align the capacity of that flow with demand. That's the green patient flow we're all familiar with. Plan for every patient, plan for all of the patients, so plan for every activity all the way through the process. But again, healthcare is a very, very useful place to see, uh, to see these questions. Actually, as we saw, critically, getting out of the hospital depends on the integration of lots of support activities that need to be done right first time on time. So in many cases, the support activities are as critical and as problematic and need to be addressed as well as the, 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 the actual flow of value creating work. But there's a third dimension which is also dealt with in the Bermuda Triangle paper, which is actually we need to also redesign 
and integrate the management processes that support this, that respond to problems and escalation and changes coming up from the process itself, but also then deploy the right projects to solve common problems uh, through redesigning the, work, the, the, the workflow. So we need to think about all three of those, and that, for me, is the unit of analysis, is all three of those types of processes that constitutes a subsystem. A subsystem is essentially a cluster of processes, integrated, interdependent processes. And an organization is a collection of those subsystems. So that's the one side. The other side is that we need to have to find a financial system that can make the process improvements, can translate those into money. And I don't mean an alternative accounting system. I think the lean accounting movement has gone off in a looking for an alternative accounting system. Toyota don't use an alternative accounting system. They use the conventional accounting system for accounts, for the outside world. But actually, as we are progressing towards an integration of activities through a shared pipeline with different routes and different bottlenecks in it, we also need a, a, a management accounting system, a management costing system that makes the financial consequences of lean visible. And that is based upon the time the product or the patient or the design spends exposed to the system. It's not surprising that most traditional financial costing systems, which are about point costing, completely don't, don't recognize any improvements in eliminating all of, the, all of the weights in between. So we need, I think, a different uh, costing system. And my colleague John Darlington and I will present, and John will really present uh, his experience of thinking through how we build a flow costing system. Very provocative. Again, John's written a paper which is available on the internet as well. So, focusing on not only the actual cost of running the pipeline, the shared resource through which the products and designs flow, but also understanding the cash tied up as a cons cash and lost sales, capital expenditure saved, as a consequence of the way we run the system. And also fundamentally lead us to understanding that eliminating waste and freeing up capacity is only half the story. It's only when we make use of that that we actually generate business results for the organization. So that flow costing story is the counterpart to understanding to the value stream analysis part. Now let's go on to the working together. Now creating Changing behaviors, as I said before, of course, is tremendously influenced by the quality of leadership and the style of leadership. And we've had a lot of discussion about that. But it is also mirrored by the conditions that you create in which people either work together or don't work together. And you've all been through the experience of value stream mapping where suddenly people are all pointing at the wall and recognizing they're the prisoners of a broken process rather than blaming each other. It's a, it's a dramatic shift in mindset. People understand that it's the process that we need to improve, not blaming people. Now, equally, I'm convinced the power of visual management isn't just the visual boards, and I've seen lots of visual boards of all kinds, but the power of the visual management actually to enable us to see not what should happen, but when when in a consistent manner. Seeing what is coming, what is the demand, what is the capacity we need to have to carry out today's work, what is the progress during the day at very frequent intervals to a common rhythm throughout the organization. So at a common rhythm, we know how things are progressing. And also, Seeing then the consequences, the plan versus actual, seeing where deviations from the plan happen in real time so we can respond to that. And real time up and down the value stream so we can see where things are happening at other points in the value stream that will have an impact on us 
a blockage further downstream that's going to prevent us with getting moving patients on. Demand coming into the system that we need to be prepared to meet. Change, change of demand, predictable fluctuation in demand, for instance. And that's where we need to integrate the visual management all along the process with a hub, with a, a, a control, a center. So we can see and respond to deviations quickly as they happen. We can respond to changes in demand, and we can also capture problems as they happen, and again, by prioritizing the impact, potential impact of those problems, we can then do root cause problem analysis. So that's one side. The other side, which I think is extremely important, and that typically happens at the Gemba, at the front line, is that we need to take the lessons not from visual management in production, but the visual management in the engineering office and product development and the project management environment, which is much more typical of top management's work, workload. We need to also use visual management there. And the two speeches that follow from Takashi and uh, from Boeing uh, are going to illustrate what I think is the key message for today. And that is this has the power, I think, of transforming the effectiveness of executives at the top and engaging them with lean in a way that Gemba activities have engaged the operations folk on the shop floor. They will describe it in detail, and I think it's a really fascinating example of taking it out of engineering into the executive suite. But for me, it answers partly one question too, which is the question, if we're going to manage the horizontal flow, if we're going to get cross-departmental, cross-functional agreement, if we're going to give somebody responsibility for redesigning those activities into a flow, we have to have a mechanism for gaining agreement. It can't be done by giving them the authority over the resources. It's about gaining agreement from the resource holders on what is the problem, on what needs to be their contributions to solving the problem, and done visually, it's kind of a promise you can't get away from. And then using that to review progress of the project on a very frequent basis, preferably daily basis. So you actually can manage by exceptions and focus management efforts on issues and capturing the learning from issues for future projects. So I think this visual management in the executive office is key. So how about the next generation? I mentioned the A3 as being a fundamental language for embodying the Plan Do Check Act scientific approach into the whole language of business. It's turning everybody, not just the executives, into scientists. And if you talk to people like uh, Art Smalley and uh, John Shook and many others, the formative experience of their, ex their, their arrival at Toyota after having gone round to various different departments was being given a problem and given an A3 form to begin the solution of that problem by their manager. And they readily, like we all do, rush to fill in the form, thinking it's a form to fill in. But actually recognize quite quickly that they haven't understood the problem. It is the most painful process and one that's seared in their minds and that they describe, whenever they describe the A3 process, of how, by asking questions, the manager got them to learn how to think in a different way, in the right way, about going through the step-by-step -step process of understanding a problem and finding countermeasures. That initial exercise, of course, is a precondition for solving much more difficult, complex problems. Not all problems are like a technical problem that you just have to dig down and you will find there is a technical answer if you've dug down far enough. And there's an answer and that's a solution and that solves the problem. In a social environment, that is not the case. It depends very heavily on the context. It very de 
cause and effect is not always clear at all. And so actually you're coming up with a hypothesis and some actions that may work, that may not work elsewhere, but may be a very good starting point for a next PDCA process when you meet that problem in a different context. So understanding how to diagnose and how to approach more complex problems is the life the work of managers. And as I said, it, keeps, it creates a common language for problem solving. And Dave will give you a flavor of that in the A3 workshop uh, later on. So that's the individual learning path of learning. Organizations also learn by doing. This is the fundamental difference between a traditional approach to rolling out a staff-driven training program across an organization in the tradi traditional manner. And it doesn't last. The experts come, the experts go again, and we'll wait for the next program. We survived that one, we'll survive this one as well. It doesn't work. Quite different if you're trying to collectively learn by doing. Get quickly into setting up improvement projects and key activities across the business. Quickly, I mean within six weeks. And then gradually building upon that, building a central resource to support those projects, and then using the Toyota principle, exactly how Toyota taught its supply base. One organization, one resource, one plant is the mentor for six other plants. And then those become the mentor for six others. This one to six cascade and the continual deepening in each of those plants is the way you get the rapid diffusion right across an organization. And building communities of practice of those plant managers, this is a line responsibility, these are line experiences. Sharing those line experiences and community of practices builds the capabilities to mentor the next step not building a bigger lean office. It's the practical experience of being there and having done it and learned and coming up with, as I say, hypotheses about what might work in your situation. And the third element is then to collect and share the stories using the A common A3 language, share the stories on an intranet so that the first reaction to any problem that you'd face is to go on the internet and see who else has solved it and had a similar problem. What tools they used, what success they had, what failures, what didn't work. Extremely important, builds a knowledge base that you can reinforce very effectively using competitions to tell the stories of best projects and recognition schemes. That's how you build a knowledge base and that's how you deploy very quickly uh, in a lean do learning by doing environment. Finally, the world's changing. The web, I am quite convinced now, it opens up completely new challenges for business. It opens up real-time feedback on pricing. There is almost no, uh, you cannot get away with, uh, hood with hoodwinking consumers anymore. Consumers can compare prices anywhere, anytime on baskets of good, whatever. So pricing isn't going to be uh, something you can simply compete upon. So real-time feedback on pricing, on products. Think about if your products could report to you on how they're used. Happens already powered by the hour with airplane engines. It could happen with many other products. And we could have real-time feedback on the use of the products and on the experience of buying and using these products. These are all going to be possible and present a huge data management issue for everybody. And my friend Alan Mitchell, who spoke at our conference two, two conferences ago, is leading an initiative to solve that problem by giving the task of managing your personal data to individuals. We then share that information with partners, potential partners, with whom we want to do business. That changing power is happening in every sector, from the manufacturer to the retailer to the customer, because the customer is no longer a stranger out there. 
the customer actually becomes part of the a potential partner in your supply chain. So, as consumers struggle to combine products, services, and knowledge to solve their problems, they're typically not buying your products, they're buying your products to solve a problem. It's the use of the products that they're buying. Then Lean makes it possible to design cost-effective solutions for different types of customers in different circumstances at different times. And that is a big challenge that is only possible once we have streamlined the back office, for instance. Once we have streamlined our capability of delivering products and services almost seamlessly, then we can think about bundling them and doing a lot more to help customers solve their problems. And the flip side of that is that the more we learn about Lean, the more we learn about the limitations of our current systems. And the more we learn that what we are dealing with is the legacy of a previous era of mass production and mass service delivery. And those organizations, those factories, those warehouses, those hospitals, those airports are actually all legacies of that era. And what we need to do, and I'm finding a lot of very interesting questions now coming from companies. Having gone through Lean, they're seeing now how would we design completely new systems that will eventually replace our existing systems and deliver services in a completely different way, make products in very different ways in different locations, and actually transform the business model, the relationship with customers. So I think that is a huge challenge and is the next challenge once we've engaged top management. It's the next challenge that I want to turn my attention to. And we have two very interesting examples in this summit. We're going to hear an example tomorrow from SAP of designing customer support activities from the customer backwards and from the process outwards. And we're also going to hear at the end of the conference from McLaren, who have built a completely new car company to build this car using lean principles. So there are two early examples, and I think this is the field for the future, is how do we design completely new systems for a new era? Let me just wrap up by turning those five questions one step further. So using the scientific problem solving in A3 language, that is about learning to think, about the, think in the right way about the right things. Using value stream analysis is about learning to see the whole and where to act. Using visual management is about learning to work together to optimize the whole. Using control experiments is about learning to learn by doing and reflecting. And designing new systems is about learning how to do new things. Finally, what we're doing, if you like, is like PDCA, but it's not just the rational side, not just the reductionist side of our brains we're engaging. It's also learning how to do new things by also adding the creative and the holistic perspective. From imagination, inspiration, and intuition added to the scientific method to develop the how to do it, that is actually the winning combination, I think, for the future. So we're actually trying to engage the two, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the brain to work together in the future, not separately.